Happy Warthog Wednesdays, everybody. I'm Shanghai. This is episode three of the big program. Glad you're with us, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end here, what uh, I'm doing for Thanksgiving. But So tonight, um, we're going to start a new uh, segment on the program that I'm calling Shanghai Story Time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read excerpts from my forthcoming book, which is entitled Two Bags Full. And this is the uh, first couple chapters. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Won't give away all the secrets in the in the uh, book, but um, but uh, this uh, episode of Shanghai Stories will explain where Two Bags Full comes from. So we'll launch into that. I got to put on my old man glasses because I'm an old man. I still got 20, 20, 2010 distance vision, but after years of reading little screens of smartphones and laptops and stuff, my uh, close-up vision is not as great, uh, especially in the evening if I'm a little tired. And so I'm going to put on my old man glasses and launch into two bags full. So in the prologue to the book, I recount a poem that I learned when I was in high school. I, I, remember, I don't know what class, some English class, we had to learn a poem. And I uh, like Robert Frost. And I remember, remember memorizing uh, his poem, Stopping by a Woods on a Snowy Evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Robert Frost. Chapter one is entitled Miles to Go. I awoke with a start as the shrill alarm broke the calm silence of the desert night. Instinctively, my right hand found the small button on my wristwatch, which put an end to the piercing sound. As my head was filled with the near constant sound of jets overhead, a part of me wanted desperately to drift back to sleep. Somewhere in the semi-conscious state of half slumber, I was curiously reminded of a poem by Robert Frost that talks about obligations as promises to keep, and wherein on another winter night, a man said he had miles to go before I sleep. I had occasionally thought of this poem over the years since first reading it in high school, most often in college when late night studying turned into all night cramming and I, barely need, and I badly needed sleep. Strange what the mind conjures up when not fully coherent. Stranger still that I should think of that poem now when so other many pressing thoughts could be on my mind. A push of another button illuminated the digital readout of my watch and confirmed that I did have promises to keep. It was 0230, Friday, January 18th, 1991. America had been at war with Iraq for nearly 24 hours, and I was to fly my first combat missions today. Miles to go before I sleep indeed. As I lay on my cot, clad in a heavily chemical protective suit, Fighting the urge to sleep, my mind raced through those heavier thoughts. I remember two days earlier when my squadron commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Irish O'Connor, by the way, as you might know if you've followed the channel, he was my first guest two weeks ago. I had a great conversation with Irish, so check that uh, uh, episode out if you haven't seen it. I remember two days earlier when my squadron commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Irish O'Connor, called his pilots together and with an inspiring speech, hinted that we might be flying combat missions soon. We had arrived at King Fahd International Airport in eastern Saudi Arabia with our 18 A-10 Thunderbolt II attack jets on the 29th of December and had spent the past three weeks preparing to bottle Saddam Hussein's formidable arm, military arm. Of course, the preparations had really been going on all throughout our military careers, which for me was five years. To hear our commander struggle for just the right words, to tell us that our personal affairs needed to be in order and our minds right, however, made the reality of it all begin to sink in. He then quietly read the names of the pilots who, when the time would come, would fly the first two days mission. When my name was read as the leader of the first aircraft uh, alert formation on day two, I confidently smiled at my designated wingman, wingman, wingman and gave him a thumbs up. At least I tried to look confident. Inside, my stomach was turning and my mind was reeling. What would it be like? How will we do? Will we all come back? I had miles to go before I would take to the skies on day two, however. 
As the chief of combat plans for the squadron, my task that night would be to receive the first air tasking order. The ATO, or FRAG as we called it, because each fighter wing only received the fragmentary portion of the entire daily air effort that was pertinent to their missions, was the document that dictated the details such as call signs, takeoff and landing times, ordinance to be carried, frequencies, and a host of other critical information to complete the mission successfully. Once the frag arrived, it would be my job to make sense of all this information with the help of the enlisted operations specialists, disseminate the information in cockpit readable form to the first day's pilots. The frag had, in fact, arrived that night, transmitted by COM US CENTAF in Riyadh. It declared that H hour was 1700 Z, January 91. I'm sorry, 17000 Z. January 19, 1991. This was a jargon of the military, which meant that the commander of the United States Central Command's Tactical Air Forces had, at the direction of our Republic's 41st President, George H.W. Bush, ordered bombs to begin dropping on key military targets inside Iraq and Kuwait on the 17th of January 1991 at midnight Greenwich Mead Time, GMT, or Zulu Time, as it was more commonly referred to in the Air Force. The area which included Southwest Asia was in the time zone known to us as Zulu plus three, which meant that the first strikes would be occurring at 3 a.m. Baghdad, Baghdad time on the 17th of January. As I lay on my cot with these thoughts quickly spurring me to a more conscious condition, I clearly remembered my feelings of awe as I held that document labeled top secret in my hands and then poured over it to find our squadron's part. I also remember pausing from our work shortly after 0300 to huddle around a portable radio as the pop music on the Armed Forces Radio Network was in interrupted by reports from Baghdad, which described in great detail jets screaming overhead, unseen in the blackness of a moonless night, and bombs dropping from the sky to break the darkness with a brief but blinding flash of fire. Then suddenly there was silence as the reporter's communication link was severed by a welled out and no a uh, well-placed and no doubt pre-planned strike. With feelings of disbelief, I announced to the five others working with me, well, boys, that's it. The war has started. Let's get our chem gear on. As those around me scurried to get into their chemical protective gear, I removed a large sealed plastic pouch which contained a heavy green chemical protective suit from my bag of protective gear. After removing the pants and jacket from the plastic pouch, I downed them and placed a set of cotton glove liners and a pair of thick rubber gloves into the canvas case that held my gas mask. This done, I strapped the gas mask to my waist and inventoried the remaining items in the large canvas A3 bag. Heavy rubber boots, flak vest, helmet, rain poncho, chemical decontamination kit, everything I would need in case of a chemical attack on our base. This bag will not be far from me for the next few days, I surmised. Finally, I popped one of the small white pyro... I'm sorry, pyrodigestamide, pyrodigestamide tablets. I'll have to learn to say that better when I'm uh, bromide tablets out of its container. According to our flight surgeon, taking one of these pills every eight hours would help prepare our bodies for nerve agent contamination. I sincerely hope the war did not come to that, but vowing to be ready, I swallowed it. With my chemical protective gear now in order, I went back to my work preparing information for the first pilots who would be arriving soon to brief their missions. With my eyes now wide open and adjusting to the darkness of my early morning surroundings, my mind raced on and retrieved the, conflicted, retrieved the conflicting feelings of concern and pride as I watched our commander, Irish O'Connor, and his wingman, one of the most experienced A-10 pilots in the Air Force, Major John Conley Condon, walk in the door as the first who would see combat. Throughout that long first day, other pilot, first night and day, other pilots pair after pair left the squadron and now i re re relieved the f now i re and now i relived the feelings of relief as i watched them two by two come back in many hours later looking very tired but grinning victoriously bursting to tell their stories i also remembered relent restlessly laying wide awake that night just six short hours ago i had recorded that first day's events in my journal and written a long emotional letter to my wife telling her how much I loved her, and I tried, I tried to write it in a way that didn't seem final, but I probably failed miserably in the attempt. I was then comp contemplating whether or not to take the no-go pill the flight surgeon had given us to induce sleep 
ensuring we would be rested for our first day of combat. It was not my habit to take drugs, even aspirin, so I wrestled, wrestled with the decision. Strangely, though, I couldn't complete this memory. Just a moment ago, it seemed so vivid, and yet I can't remember my decision. I knew I'd won the battle with my urge to return to sleep when it suddenly dawned on me why I couldn't complete this memory. It had been my last thought before falling asleep. And for six hours, there were no memories. There was no time. There was only sleep. Another push of the button and a glance at the watch, 0231. What a contrast from the world of sleep. In the space of only 60 seconds, the memories of a hugely emotional day had flooded back through my emerging consciousness. An amazing thing, the mind I mused, not knowing how prophetic that statement would be later on. Enough reminiscing, I told myself, time to keep those promises. I traded the sanctum and warmth of my bed for the uncertainty and cold of another desert winter morning. As I fumbled for the pull cord I had rigged up to turn on the light, finding the cord, I gave it a tug and let my eyes adjust to the harsh light of the bare bulb hanging above the cot in the interior walled room of the tent that was my home. The room was one of six in a white 40 by 25 temper tent. The tent was erected around a wooden floor and was surrounded on the outside by sandbags, which held the sides in place at the ground. Inside, plywood partitions had been built with plywood doors to provide some degree of quiet and privacy for pilots. Additionally, electrical, electric lights were wired to each room and a heat and air duct hung in the peak of the roof above the hallway, which ran lengthwise down the middle of the tent. Although far from providing all the usual comforts of home, the tent was generally quite comfortable and certainly provided more luxury than the living conditions of many others in the deserts of Southwest Asia that night. I counted my blessings and pressed on. Traded my chemical suit for a sweat jacket and pants. I slipped into my shoes, grabbed my slaving, shaving kit, and snapped off the light as I left the room, not wanting to, to ruin the not wanting to ruin the chemical protective gear by exposing it to the wet and damp environment of the shower tent. I left it behind. Besides, we were told we'd have at least five minutes advance warning of any attack, such as Scud missiles, which would allow time to run back to my room, grab my gear, and route to the sand bay bag bunker erected just outside our tent. Upon opening the door at the end of the hallway, a chill of the desert night hit me as above another pair of A-10s roared overhead, red and green position lights marking, marking their outline, white strobe lights blinking. Up there, pilots from one of the two night flying squadrons were arriving back from a mission, no doubt happy to be alive and probably looking forward to sleep. Soon it will be my turn, I thought. Scanning upward as I walked the hundred yards to the shower tent, I marveled at the expense of sky above me. With most every outside light on, the air base off, all the buildings blacked out, and with no moon to spoil the darkness, the stars seemed incredibly close. I smiled at them, hoping they promised clear skies would soon follow. The last thing I needed were clouds to highlight my airplane to the gunners, who would surely be trying to kill me in just a few hours. I found my tent mate and wingman, Captain, Captain Scott Sparky Johnston, had beat me to the showers and was toweling off as I walked in. Morning, Sparky, I said, trying to sound cheery. Morning, Shankster, he replied, using his familiar variation of the more common tactical so call sign of Shanghai. Looks like a great, great day for combat, huh? He added. You bet, I answered, hoping I sound confident. See you at three. See you on the three o'clock bus, he said as he left the tent. Roger that, I called out after him. As the water ran over my toothbrush, I mentally reviewed the items I wanted to cover with him in our pre-flight briefing. We had spent a great deal of time over the past few days discussing tactics. We had talked about how we would work together, what I expected him of him as my wingman, and what he could expect of me as his flight lead. We would be combat pairs, and as such, would be flying most of our combat missions together. The thought was that by pairing up two pilots to fly together, often greater teamwork would result, thereby creating greater effectiveness. Sparky was one of the new guys in the squadron, having arrived only a few months before we deployed. He had recently completed pilot training, and after a three-month course at A-10 Replacement Training Unit, was assigned to his first operational fighter tour as a pilot. My squadron, the 511th Tactical Fighter Squadron, Vultures, at Royal Air Force Base Alconbury in the United Kingdom, was lucky to get him. Having previously been a weapons systems officer in F-4 Phantoms, Sparky was far from a fledgling in the air. He knew the air-to-ground business, especially enemy air, air radar systems and countermeasures, and had already contributed quite a bit to the squadron. I was fortunate and pleased to have him as my wingman, and despite his relative inexperience in the A-10, I knew he would do well. 
I brushed my teeth, ran a razor across my face, and after a quick splash under the shower head, hurried back through the night to dress for a day of combat flying. Entering the tent, I saw that the light in Sparky's room at the end of the hall was out. He was probably laying in the darkness deep in thought about things to come. Perhaps he was thinking of some question he would ask me during our briefing, some point that we hadn't discussed before. I hoped I would have the right answer. I hoped I had thought of everything. The margin of error will likely be very small, I thought. Pushing open the first door on the left, I felt around grabbing handfuls of air a couple of times before finding the cord dangling from the ceiling. I gave it a yank, and once again, my small room was bathed in the harsh white light of the bare 60-watt bulb. Hanging my damp towel over the line I had strung up in one corner, I dropped my shaving kit on the green nylon army cot, which ran across the far wall and served as my catch-all shelf. Also on the cot were two of the large A3 bags. Because of the constant dust problem associated with the desert living, I was still living out of these bags. I dug into one and selected a pair of cotton underwear and socks and one of the dark green t-shirts. Curious, I thought, even in the desert in a desert war, the Air Force still issues green t-shirts. Originally colored green so as not to highlight a downed aviator against the forested jungle background of places such as Vietnam. These t-shirts now seemed out of place in light of the brown color of the desert, which would grab up anyone who ejected from a crippled aircraft. Small problem considering my entire flight suit is also a sage green, I thought. Letting this thought pass from my mind, it then dawned on me again. My jet is also painted in, in, in the jungle camo green. Still, I quickly dressed in my underclothes, ran a comb through my still damp hair, and then looked at my flight suit, stark and hanging from the makeshift clothes bar in another corner. It was the new chemical protective flight suit we pilots were issued the day before, impregnated with protective car charcoal, but still retaining the Nomex flight retardant of our normal flight suit. It was stiff and scratchy. The only insignia on it was a pair of cloth, which was a patch of cloth with Air Force pilot's wings and my name embroidered on it. And even this was different than normal. The familiar large black tag with royal blue wings and name, often call sign, sometimes even the outline of a head-on A-10, signifying the colors of our squadron and the aircraft that we've flown, had been replaced with a smaller sage green tag with dark navy embroidery. Before pulling the flight suit from the hangar, I rummaged through each of its seven zippered pockets. Should I end up a prisoner of war today, I didn't want any unnecessary items to be given to give the enemy any clues about my life. Other than a blue nylon wallet containing 100 American dollars and 100 Saudi rials my Gen and my Geneva Convention card, I found only a small pocket knife, a comb, a plain white handkerchief, and my dog tags, which I elected to leave in the pocket because in the cockpit with constant head turning to scan the skies around me, the metal chain rubbed my neck raw. Satisfied that my flight suit was properly sanitized, I pulled it on and zipped it up. After lacing up my leather flying boots and affixing my double-edged boot knife and sheath to the left boot, I took a long look at the portfolio pictures which hung by the door, pictures of my wife, pictures from back home, pictures from happier times. Aloud I said to them, see you when you get, see you when I, aloud I said to Angela, the picture of Angela, see you when I get back. Grabbing up my bag of chemical protective gear, I gave a tug on the light cord and the room went dark. Sparky was taking in the grandeur of the night sky as I emerged from the tent. He looked at me. We exchanged nods and silently walked between the rows of tents towards the street. A van was waiting to pick us up there. As we rode a mile or so to our squadron building, I marveled at the transformation which had taken place in just the three weeks since we arrived at King Fod International Airport. The airport was not completed. In fact, except for the runways, two massive runways, the control tower and the requisite mosque, only the skeletons of major structures had been erected. Since the late August arrival of four squadrons of A-10s, the civilian airport construction had ceased and the temporary military air base construction had commenced. With the late December and early January arrivals of two more A-10 squadrons, including mine, and one OA-10 forward air control squadron, the flight line was now overflowing with fighters. The great expanses of concrete that had been designated for parking Jumbo jets had been sectioned off with tall, sand-filled metal revetments, which provided protection for the 132A-10s and 12 OA-10s assigned to the 354th Tactical Fighter Wing Provisional. In fact, even the parking ramp in front of the terminal designed exclusively for the use of King Fod and his royal family had been transformed into homes 
for the jet fighters sent to protect his country and liberate that of his neighbor to the north, Sheikh Jabbar al-Hamad al-Sabah, Emir of Kuwait. The radical departures from the architect's designs extended far beyond the flight line, though. Seemingly everywhere within the huge airport boundaries, concertina wired, sandbag bunkers had sprung up. The changes were also evident as we paused at one of the many fortified entry control checkpoints to hold up our identification cards for the scrutiny of a heavily armed Air Force security policeman. Driving on, we entered the compound of large metal warehouses encircled by a tall barbed wire fence. Evidence of military presence was everywhere in the compound, from the large satellite communication dishes, barely visible in the darkness, to the camouflage netting, much of it painted to match the desert surroundings. The driver of the van, one of our squadron's enlisted life support technicians, pulled up to the back of one of the metal buildings and stopped. We had reached our destination, warehouse number six, home to the 706 TFS Cajuns of the Air Force Reserve in New Orleans, and my squadron, the 511th Vultures part of the United States Air Forces in Europe. Chapter two, warehouse number six had been transformed from, transformed from a large empty space into the hub of activity for two fighter squadrons. Inside partitions had been erected to separate the two squadrons and create offices and briefing rooms. Life support racks had been built to hold flight gear and grease boards for posting the flying schedule had been hung. With the addition of chairs and desks, we were ready for business within a day of arrival. Outside portable generators were supplying electrical power to run the heating and air conditioning units as well as a myriad of electrical equipment necessary to keep the business of a fighter squadron going. Sparky and I had entered the now familiar environment with a newfound purpose. It was 0310. Quickly we set to work gleaning all the information the night duty officer had to offer and began copying the most important data onto cards we would clip to our knee boards for easy reference in flight. Finding our names on the large scheduling board behind the duty desk, we learned that we would be mission number 5065 Alpha, call sign Weatherby 65. We copied this information onto our cards and each signed out on one of the thick combat in, signed out one of the thick combat in-flight guides called Flimsies, which were the source of the most of the information we would need in flight. Finding an open briefing cubicle, we went through the combat flimsies, copying some of the call signs, frequency, code words, and navigation data onto our cards. Because we were to be on alert and therefore did not know where we were going or what our target would be, we reviewed the procedures for several different possibilities rather than focusing on one in particular, as several other pairs of pilots were now doing. Those not on alert had the luxury of knowing where their targets were and had set times to plan on. Sparky and I, on the other hand, only knew that at 0500, we were to be in our jets with our engines running, ready for takeoff, ready for any tasking, ready for combat. Having thoroughly reviewed the combat flimsies, we walked to the far wall of the warehouse where our intelligence officer had set up shop. He had erected some plywood boards and had a large detailed map of Kuwait and Iraq tacked to them. On the map, he had plotted known areas of surface-to-air missile and anti-aircraft artillery activity. With red grease pencils, we jotted some of this information onto our plastic-covered maps as he rattled off a short prepared briefing describing recent enemy activity. We then briefly reviewed escape and evasion procedures with him and asked, and he asked if we had any questions. As we shook our heads no, he bid us good luck and good hunting. Back in our briefing cubicle, we briefly talked about some of the threats we had plotted on our maps and feeling we pretty much had our ducks in a row, I started the more formal portion of our briefing. I began giving a time hack to synchronize our, to synchronize our watches. Three, two, one, hack. 0330, I stated. Call sign, Weatherby 65, mission number 5650 Alpha. For the first one, Bravo and Charlie, if we fly a second and a third. We'll step at 0400, start at 0430, and check in on channel one at 0445 to meet our on status time of 0500, I continued. By the time 15 minutes had passed, I had covered all the necessary items in my briefing checklist and asked Sparky if he had any questions. Nope, he replied. Sounds good. Get hot, I replied, using the time-honored fighter pilot phrase of joyous affirmation. 15 minutes to step. Time enough for breakfast. I sounded confident, but as Sparky got up to leave the briefing cubicle, I again wondered if I thought of everything. We'll soon know, I surmised. I rummaged through the cardboard box full of meals ready to eat and selected one labeled MRE meal number six, chicken a la king. Sparky chose one containing a mixture that was, according to the label, supposed to taste like a ham and cheese omelet, and he sank into a chair to enjoy his meal. I took out my pocket knife, 
cut into the heavily rubberized brown pouch and then pass the knife to Sparky. As he tore into his pouch, I reached inside mine and pulled out the slender cardboard box, which surrounded another pouch containing my chosen entree. As Sparky passed the knife back, I reached past the packets of cocoa powder, crackers, peanut butter, freeze-dried fruit to retrieve the plastic spoon and the package of M&M chocolate candies. With my gourmet delights in hand, I headed for the men's room. <laughs> Standing over the sink, I ran the water full of full hot and pulled up the stopper. Having removed the pouch containing the chicken mixture from the cardboard box, I dropped it in the nearly boiling water and left it sit for a minute or so. I then let the water drain from the sink, carefully grabbed the steaming pouch by the corner, and headed out of the men's room to enjoy my breakfast feast. Although not quite hot, the chicken a la king was warm and actually fairly tasty, probably as tasty as prepackaged chicken a la king can be at zero dark 30 on one's first morning of combat. Sitting in the briefing cubicle, staring at my one to 500,000 scale map of Kuwait, I shoveled the concoction down my throat, took a couple long swings from a bottle of water, and discarded the pouch and spoon into the trash can. Breakfast was over. Time to go flying. I gathered up the checklist and maps and stuffed them into the various compartments of my custom-made Cordura nylon saddlebag, which was designed to fit neatly over the instrument panel of the A-10. Saddlebag in hand, I headed to my life support rack to suit up in my flying gear. Finding my equipment hanging on the rack ready to go, I began by donning my anti-G suit. This dark green form-fitting piece of equipment worn in all modern jet fighters closely resembles the chaps worn by cowboys, except the legs fit tighter. It's actually a corset type affair with inflatable air bladders which fit over the abdomen, thighs, and calves. A hose protruding from the left side connects to a hose in the cockpit, so when making a tight turn or pulling out of a dive, high-pressure air is forced into the bladders commensurate with the forces of gravity called G-forces generated by the aircraft. In a particularly tight turn or during a high-speed dive, pull, pulling out of a high-speed dive, it is typical to pull five or six Gs. It's called pulling Gs because the pilot controls the magnitude of the forces with how hard he pulls on the control stick. In the way the force generated by the Earth's rotation is one G and keeps objects stationary, the force created by such maneuvers results in objects, including body parts, feeling five or six times heavier than normal. This, of course, makes it difficult for the heart to keep pumping blood to the head and similarly tends to force blood to the lower extremities of the body. The air bladders help combat this pooling of blood by pushing against the abdomen and legs. More accurately, they create something to push against as you tighten your muscles and strain to keep the blood pumping upward. This straining, or L1 maneuver as it is called, is critical to maintaining vision and consciousness as the eyes and brain particularly need a regular supply of blood to keep functioning properly. It was this relatively simple answer to the amazing physiolog physiology of the fighter cockpit that I pulled around my waist. With the two halves of the zipper in front, I fastened the two eye hooks and zipped the upper portion together. I then rotated it around my waist to the right until the rubber air bladder was over my abdomen, wrapped the split left leg portions around my thigh, fastened the hook at the inside top of the leg, and zipped it down over my boot knife to my ankle. I repeated this procedure with my right leg, and my G-suit was on. I paused from my dressing for a moment to stuff a couple boxes of raisins, a couple small bags of peanuts, and the M&Ms from my MRE into the lower left leg of the G-suit. The peanuts and the raisins my mom had called energy food in the letter accompanying the care package that had arrived a few days earlier. Into the right leg pocket, I slipped two plastic flasks of frozen water. The fight against dehydration was a constant battle in a fighter cockpit. Next, I positioned my knee board high on my right thigh, pulled the elastic straps tightly around my leg, and attached the Velcro strips together to hold it in place. When the air bladders in the G-suit inflated, the elastic straps would expand to keep the Velcro from ripping apart. This done, I grabbed the bulging survival vest off the rack, slipped my right arm through the appropriate hole, swung the vest around my back, slipped my left arm through the other hole. Before zipping it up, I put a plastic bag containing evasion maps into an inside pocket. The plastic bag also contained my blood shit, which was a pointy talkie paper that stated in both English and various uh, Arabic languages that I was a downed American pilot who needed help. It promised the rewards of a grateful United States government of assistance was given and even had serial numbered tabs in the corners that could be ripped off and given to the person rendering the assistance. Sort of a down pilot claim check, someone once mused. I zipped up the nylon vest, pulled the PRC-112 survival radio from the largest of the outside pockets, and rotated the switch to the on position. As I turned the volume control full up, I heard a hissing sound that told me the radio was working. 
After turning the volume knob back to its minimum setting, I switched the radio back off, stowed it back in the vest pocket. Satisfied that my survival vest was in order, I pulled on the green nylon harness with its metal buckets and fittings that would soon connect me to the ejection seat and its eternal parachute. Next, I grabbed my helmet with its oxygen mask attached off the top rack and shoved it into my green nylon helmet bag. Technically, I was supposed to function check my oxygen mask and its built-in microphone on a test bench in the corner, but finding that it always worked because our life support technicians were so awesome, I'd abandoned this chore long ago. The next thing was to walk over and be issued a sidearm. I remember musing, if I need this gun, it's going to be have been a really bad day. Originally in England, we were, I'll just stop here and interject that originally in England, we had uh, the uh, 9mm Beretta. That's what we'd qualified on. It was a great, great, uh, great pistol. But when the stateside boys went over to the desert, uh, some of the squadrons had 38 revolvers, the old long barreled 38. No kidding, like a Western six shooter. It held six uh, 38 caliber rounds. Um, this spinning cylinder, it had a big wooden handle with a brass plate on the end of it. And we'd sent our nine millimeters over to the desert for the guys to swap out their 38 so they'd have a more capable sidearm. Um, well, then we went to the desert and guess what? We got their 38s. So, so I was uh, issued a 38. We would um, uh, clear it, load it into a drum, and then it went into a holster on the uh, side of the uh, survival vest. This is just the first draft of the book. And so um, there's a lot of notes in the margin. So I'm trying to trying to read it in a coherent manner. And um, and then I've got a bunch of notes um, that I'll add to the next draft. Um, it's been a long progress writing this book. I started it in the desert, actually, after the conflict was over. And then um, and I, I wrote a, some on it probably in the next year, but then just got busy with life. And about 30 years later, picked it back up. And so now I'm in a um, in a kind of all out uh, effort to get it finished. Um, I would hope to have it ready by Christmas. That's not going to happen. It's now going to be spring. Uh, I think I'm going to self-publish it. So that's uh, created something of a delay. And then also, as I just continued to uh, edit and edit. And finally, I took Mover's advice, who told me, Shanghai, just finish your first draft. Even if it's a shitty first draft, it's a lot easier to edit than it is to create. So uh, I've got a lot of notes here, but I'm reading it as the sort of shitty first draft. And uh, hopefully we'll get it uh, edited up here over the holidays and um, get it off for printing and, and uh, have it available uh, sometime uh, early spring of next year. And at the end of the program, stand by for a special offer that I'm going to have um, that re relates to Thanksgiving and the book. So uh, back to uh, back to the uh, I'm going to look I'm going to take a quick look at the comments here just to see if anything like this sucks and I hate it or. You read like a dork. Bum, bum, bum. Happy Thanksgiving, Rebel. Good to see you, man. Scott Atwood. Hey, Scott, man. Scott was my second guest. Good to see you on the on the uh, on the podcast as well. And um, thanks for the comment. Appreciate that, man. And Zenith remembers miles to go. Sweet. Scott wants an autographed copy. <laughs> yeah, Scott. I think I can uh, I can make that happen for you, bud. Not only autograph, but um, but also with a nice inscription, man. You're awesome, dude. And I really appreciate you being my episode two guest. By the way, I think my next guest, episode four, will be um, uh, a week from today. I'm hoping to have uh, Scott Sparky Johnson, my combat pair that I just referred to in the book and I'll be referring to here a lot more in a few minutes. I'm hoping to have Sparky on. Man, it would be great to talk to him again, just like it was to Scott and to the old boss Irish. So good. But, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's a good teaser, Scott, for my um, end of the podcast announcement about the Thanksgiving and um, homeless vets and the book. So stand by for sure. All right. Uh, we referred to uh, oh, here, here we go. Uh, here we go. As I was undertaking the pre-flight dress, dressing ritual. And it was a ritual for fighter pilots seemingly each had their own way of doing it and never varied in their approach. Sparky was also suiting up a few steps away. 
Having donned our equipment and with helmet bags and saddlebags and gas masks in hand, we paused at the operations desk for last-minute instructions from a duty officer. As we signed the form which served as our flight authorization, the duty officer gave us each three blank videotapes for our aircraft recorders and briefed us on our aircraft's tail numbers and parking spots. We referred to a particular aircraft by the last three digits of the numbers painted on the vertical stabilizer or tails. The entire six-digit number comprised the serial number of the aircraft. My jet for the day was tail number 157, which this is not in the book. I'll have to edit it in. But as uh, Scott knows, 157 was his jet. Scott Atwood was the crew chief for 157. That was our boss's airplane. Um, I don't think, Scott, you'll have to help me with this. I don't think we had the, the nose art painted on the aircraft quite yet. But that one became the, I have to do this until my book. Fighting Irish was uh, 157, Scott's jet. And we called it the boss jet, but it was really Scott's jet. Scott owned that jet, and he let the boss borrow it for flights. My jet for the day was tail number 157 and spot, parking number spot parking spot F10, Foxtrot 10. I copied this information on the card clipped to my headboard. And now the only thing to do was wait for the van to arrive and head out to the jets. And thus started one of my new pre-flight rituals. I didn't know at that time it would be a pre-flight part of my pre-flight ritual. I thought it might be an anomaly, but I had to go find a corner of the warehouse to dry heave. It wasn't the breakfast. It was nerves. It wasn't nerves so much that, um, that I might not come home. It was nerves that I would screw something up, that I would get Sparky killed, that I would dishonor our squadron. And I was to do that 44 more, 43 more times over the next uh, 42 days. The duty officer called good hunting as we walked out the door back into the still black morning. I glanced at my watch, 0400, so far right on time, a good start. Weighted down by all the flight gear, we climbed clumsily into the dark step van waiting just outside the warehouse door, deposited our gear onto the floor, and sat down for the ride to the flight line. We sat quietly with our own thoughts as the driver worked his way across the base toward our waiting aircraft. I found myself thinking about the pre-flight checks required of the six Mark 82 bombs, the two AGM 65D Maverick missiles, and the two AIM-9 Mike Sidewinders that I would carry. I'd never dropped. I'd only once ever dropped live bombs, and that was in initial A-10 training some five years ago. I'd never shot a live Maverick missile. I certainly didn't want to screw it up now. I'll check everything very carefully, I thought. Sparky and I didn't exchange any words during the five-minute ride to the flight line. We silently dug into our pockets to show our ID cards to the security policeman guarding the entry control point. And, uh, and nodded as he said, get some for me. Shortly, the driver stopped in front of my jet. As I climbed out of the van, my jet looked incredibly ominous in the glow of the dim spotlights trained on it. Shadows from the, muni the munitions hung under the wings cast an eerie figure on the walls of the revetment it was parked in, and the crew chief seemed like a specter as he ducked under the wings and fuselage, making last-minute checks. By the way, turns out that specter was almost certainly Scott Atwood, so <laughs> that's awesome. I, I hadn't really realized until I interviewed Scott and looked at my logbook that 157, his jet, was the jet that I flew this first uh, first morning into combat. So uh, it's this a little even more personal now and, and more interesting. And I might have to uh, modify it even some more now that um, and now I've got Scott's uh, perspective on it as well. In fact, and during the book, I'm, I'm going to be introducing a, um, a little segment throughout the book called um, Other Voices. And so... Scott, I'll be reaching out to you to to maybe um, you know add your own words into what this morning like was like for you, perhaps, or what it was just like in general for you to get a jet ready. So um, stand by for that uh, in the in the final version of Two Bags Full at your favorite bookseller somewhere in spring. Before I close the rear door of the van, I broke the silence as I said to Sparky, "Give me a call on button one if you have any problems." See you on the radio," he replied as the van drove off into the darkness. I returned the crew chief's salute and his sharp, good morning, sir, and traded my helmet and saddlebags for the aircraft's maintenance records he was offering. As he climbed the aircraft ladder to put my gear in the cockpit, I scrutinized the maintenance form 
maintenance record or forms as we called them with the aid of a small flashlight when i was satisfied that all was well the paperwork at least indicating the aircraft was ready for combat i started my pre-flight walk around i'm going to pause here again and say that over the next jesus ton of pages that many big big bunch of pages i go through um what most of this chapter is about is a very detailed sort of system by system, switch by switch, in conversation with the crew chief, what we're talking about to get the aircraft ready and started up. I'm not going to read all through that because it's pretty tedious probably for, you know, a, just to sit and listen to. But for the real geeks out there, the real fighter geeks, the real A-10 fans, um, I think it's going to gonna offer a, a really interesting insight into what, you know, what it was really like flying the airplane. The idea of my book is is a firsthand in the cockpit account. I want to put you in the cockpit with me as I'm flying the hog into combat um, uh, 40 times. So um, I'll skip that part for for this because this is I, I ideally meant to just be sort of a sort of a prelude to the book. Um, some interesting stories, as I said, stories story time, which I think I'm calling it Shanghai story time. And so I'm going to jump ahead to um, when we've got the aircraft all started up, everything ready to go, all the systems checked out, everything's good. And now I'm just standing by to either receive some tasking from uh, the ops or to shut down just to APU power so that all my systems are still running. I don't have to align my inertial navigation system and all that anymore. Just start the two engines and I'm ready to go. Um, so um, I'm gonna finish with the last check that I did. I reached back onto the panel on my left and turned the aircraft's video tape recorder on to title the tape. Flipping the switch to record, I held my mask to my face and said into its built-in microphone, Weather B-65, mission number 5065 Alpha, Captain Shihai, tail number 157, 18 January 91, 0430. Finally, I rechecked the radio frequencies and was ready for check-in. Five minutes left. As I sat in the dim and silent cockpit, I once again noticed how dry my mouth was. This is Back to the dry heave story. Reaching for my water bottle, I also began to notice a twinge in the pit of my stomach, nerves. Finally, the reality of the task, again, ahead, began to register with me. Chapter 3. Weather be 6-5, check uniform, I said, depressing the transmit button for the UHF radio on the right throttle with the thumb of my left hand. Two, was Sparky's reply. Weather be go active. Two. After selecting the jam-resistant mode of communications, I said, weather be check active. Too loud and clear was Sparky's response, which was a bit garbled due to the scrambling of the signal. One loud and clear, go button one plane. Two. Weatherby, check Victor, I said, this time thumbing this transmit switch up to activate the VHF radio. Two. I then re reached down to the panel of near my left side and moved the radio's master wafer switch from the VHF position to FM, thumb the switch on the throttle up again, as I said, weatherby, check Fox. With all the radios working perfectly, I called the squadron operations desk to report that we were ready for tasking. Vulture Ops, weather B-65, on status. Ops copies, stand by. As we waited in silence, I imagined the squadron duty officer picking up the secure telephone, dialing the wing operations center to report that the first two alert jets were ready to go. After two or three minutes that seemed like an eternity, the duty officer called back with our tasking. <coughs> Excuse me. Weatherby 6-5, Vulture Ops, rather ready to copy tasking. Ops, Weatherby Go, I nervously said, ready to copy the data onto the card on my kneeboard. Take off ASAP, contact Blacklist on Coral 3, backup Coral 4 for further words. Weatherby copies all, I replied. Go button 3, 2. Chief, go ahead and pull the chocks. We're ready to go. I'm on the brakes. As the crew chief removed the wooden chocks, from in front of the main landing gears, the, the main landing gears tires, I reached down to the radio on my left and turned the preset knob, changing from channel one to channel three. I then checked Sparky in on the ground control frequency. Weather be six five, check two. Fod ground, weather be six five. Taxi two of you safety's finest, I said in my best fighter pilot radio voice. At the instant the ground controller began to speak, however, the command post began broadcasting on guard frequency, drowning him out. Alarm red, alarm red, alarm red. In the background, I could hear the drone of the sirens just beginning to blare. The message delivered 
was with an urgency that I had never before heard. Even in the most realistic of peacetime training exercise, the meaning was never clearer. The airfield was under attack. Probably a scud, I thought. Got to get armed up and get airborne. Chief, pull the weapons pins. We're arming up right here. No answer. Chief, how do you read me? Still no answer. Then it dawned on me. He had heard the alarm red call over the interphone and had unplugged and gone for the cover of a nearby sandbag bunker. Smart. I glanced over the side of the canopy rail and confirmed it. My crew chief had pulled, put the boarding letter up, pulled his communication cord out, and was gone. Probably already in a gas mask with his bunker on. He's no fool. Sparky, did you hear the alarm red? Roger, he tensely, tersely replied. Is your crew chief still up? Affirmative. He's putting on his mask. Okay, my crew chief was smarter than yours. He's in the bunker. Have yours pull all your pins now and then tell him to take cover. I'll meet you in the arming area. We got to launch now. I said, trying to control my heightened emotions. As I pushed the throttles forward, engaged the nose wheel steering with a button on the control stick, flipped my taxi light on to illuminate the yellow taxi line, and rolled out of the revetment. Sparky's, I thought, Sparky's parked on the king's ramp. He'll beat me to the army area. I turned the shortest direction toward the army area at the end of the runway. I wanted to get airborne as soon as I could, but I also wanted to get armed up if possible. Otherwise, I would have to land once the attack was over and get armed before we could complete our assigned tasking. I didn't even know if that was possible. If the ground pounders were in trouble, two minutes spent now could save 20 minutes later. Put the canopy down and turn the ECS off, I thought. I almost forgot. By closing the canopy and turning the environmental control system off, I could hopefully keep most chemical contamination from entering the cockpit. I didn't know if there was an inbound scud, if it contained a chemical warhead, but I reached down on the right side of my right, reached down on my right side and flipped the switches which closed the canopy and shut off the flow of outside air to the cockpit. As the canopy closed, I could make out the faint, ominous wailing of the air raid sirens even still. My mind was reeling as I taxied toward the arming area. I pushed on the right rudder pedal to make a 90-degree turn toward the main taxiway that paralleled the runway, and was startled when nothing happened. The aircraft kept rolling straight. Quickly, I centered the rudder pedals and jabbed the nose wheel steering button in again. The green light labeled nose wheel steering on the panel in front of me illuminated. And as I pushed on the right rudder pedal again, this time, the aircraft turned as it should. Relieved, I rolled towards the main taxiway and tried to calm down. My heart seemed to be beating a thousand times a minute. And I was breathing very heavily. Weather B1, where are you? Turning onto the parallel by the foxtrot row. I, to Sparky's tense... To Sparky's Tez communication, I replied, turning down to the parallel by the Fox chat roll. I'll be down there in a minute. Even as I said this, I applied another boot full of right rudder to turn onto the main taxiway, and again, nothing happened. I was only about 75 feet from crashing into a revetment wall, so I stomped on the tops of both red pedals, applying the brakes and bringing my craft to an abrupt stop. Shit, 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 I yelled aloud, wishing someone were there to hear it. What is wrong with this nose wheel steering? This is no time for this to happen, I thought. I depressed the gut button again, but this time no light. I jabbed at it several more times rapidly and tried holding it in and jiggling it. Nothing worked. In over 600 hours of flying the A-10, I'd never had this problem before. Of course, at any other time, I would simply stop, call the maintenance supervisor on the radio, and have them come to take a look. Or at any other time, my crew chief would be standing back where I just taxied away from, and he'd run over there and probably fix it in a second. It wasn't an option now, though. More jabs on the button and a couple of blows to the stick. Still no light. Damn it. Okay, stay calm. You can figure this out. Springfield, 6-7, check. Two. Shit. The other alert formation is taxiing out, I thought. They were scheduled 15 minutes behind us, so they were probably just climbing in their cockpits when the alarm sounded. They started up quickly, and they're ready to taxi out and launch for survival as well. Weatherby, Springfield, where are you, the leader of the other two ship asked me. Weatherby 1's parallel. Weatherby 1's on the parallel, heading for the army area. Two's waiting down there for me. Where are you guys? Springfield 1's behind your number two. Springfield 2 is coming out of the foxes. What's the holdup, Weatherby? Let's go, he said, his voice raising with each word. Why couldn't maintenance park the formations together? I briefly lamented. Sorry, Scott. Not, not just above your pay grade, I'm sure. Stand by, Springfield. I'll be there in a minute, I said. My tone rising to match his. Got to calm down, man. Get it under control, I thought. Concentrate. Use differential braking. As the thought entered my mind, I simultaneously eased the power forward and pushed down on the right brake. The jet started to move forward, then shuddered to the right. With just the right combination of brake and power, I was able to turn the aircraft and straighten it out on the taxiway. Shit hot. I pushed the power to increase my speed and then chopped the throttles back to idle. 
the 55,000 pounds of inertia that was my aircraft would coast me along at a quick enough pace, especially with no steering to keep me straight. Don't screw it up now. Springfield 2's taxi light was visible in the three rear view mirrors mounted across the top of my aircraft's canopy bow and approaching the Army area. I saw Sparky waiting for me to come by and Springfield 1 pulling up behind me. As I continued straight ahead, Sparky, uh, straight ahead past Sparky, I pointed directly at the bunker next to the Army area and turned on the powerful landing light, which, like the taxi light, was mounted above the nose wheel tire. As the light hit the bunker, I pushed the brake pedals alternately to move the tire from side to side, creating the effect of flashing the light across the entrance to the sandbag sanctuary, something that we called the elephant. My hopes of catching the attention of those inside were realized when three shadowy figures came running out in full chemical gear. I flipped the lights off and held the brakes while the Army crew pulled the pins that held the bombs, missiles, and the gun safe. Within a minute, they had pulled the pins, stuffed them into the left gear pod panel, and were retreating back to their bunker. Once again, applying power and brakes in concert, I turned 90 degrees right and pointed at the runway. Weatherby, go button four. Toop. Weatherby, check. Toop. Fod tower. Weatherby 6-5 is taking 3-4 right for an immediate. No reply. A glance towards the approach in. No landing light. Looks clear. Fod tower. Weatherby 6-5. No reply. Screw the tower. We're going. Weatherby 2. Pre-takeoff checks. Take 20 seconds. We're rolling. To Wilco, Sparky said, his voice cracking slightly. As I fought the pedals to aim down the runway, I moved the flap lever to the first attempt, flipped the IFF anti-skid, pedal heat, and strobe lights on, and armed my ejection seat. I then pushed both throttles forward as far as they would go and began hurtling down the runway into the darkness. 130, 140, 145, rotate. With a gentle pull on the stick, the nose wheel lifted off. As the wings bit the air, they took the burden of the 55,000 pounds from the main gear, and I was flying. Chapter 4. We were passing 12,000 feet in the climb before I began to become one with my aircraft. Since the confusion and chaos of the taxi and takeoff, it was one. It was as if I were merely along for the ride, an outside observer rather than an active participant. Finally now, I was beginning to feel in control again. I noticed how sluggish my craft was with the heavy load of bombs and missiles I carried. I had never flown an aircraft this heavy before. We had been airborne for nearly 15 minutes, and we were still not up to 15,000 feet. Still, however, there was my heart, which was beating uncontrollably. I've really got to calm down. Shot glass. Weatherby 6-5 is switching to blacklist, I said during a short break in the continuous radio chatter. Shot glass copies Weatherby. I'll bet they're glad to be rid of us. One less flight to worry about. Weatherby, go Coral 3 uniform, I directed. Doop. I glanced at my kneeboard for the frequency that corresponded to Coral 3, straining to read the numbers in the dim red glow of the map light trained on my frequency card. Finally making out the numbers, I dialed 355.6 into the frequency display window. With the click of the selector switch from preset to manual, I left the static behind and was relieved to have a clear frequency with which to talk to the desk. I didn't know what caused this frequency Stat the static on the CRC's frequency, but wartime modes of different systems were causing a lot of new electrons to fly through the sky this morning, and interference was likely with many radio frequencies. I was just glad to know my radio wasn't causing the problem. Whether it be 6-5, check, 2. And then it dawned on me, where's Sparky? I looked over my left shoulder and then my right, and there he was, exactly where he should be. Perfect wedge position, about 2,500 feet or so, off and behind my right wing. Blacklist, whether it be 6-5, silence. Blacklist, blacklist, whether it be 6-5, more silence, and then background static, this time self-induced as I purposely flipped the squelch control off to allow a weaker signal to be heard. And there it was, a faint but audible reply, whether it be 6-5, blacklist, push, coral 5. Blacklist must be having interf interference problems, too, I thought. Weatherby, push Coral 5, too. Coral 5 was not a frequency we had anticipated using. It was not listed in the frag, so we hadn't copied it onto my card. I reached for my thick flimsy and fumbled with it in the darkness to find the correct frequency page. Holding the flimsy under the bap light, I found Coral 5 and dialed 378.2 into the UHF radio. I waited a few extra seconds before Sparky before checking Sparky in, knowing he had his hands full, finding the freak in his flimsy while also flying night formation. Weatherby 6-5, check. Toop. Sparky's always there. Blacklist. Weatherby 6-5. Weatherby, Blacklist has you loud and clear. How me? 
Weatherby, 6-5, reads blacklist. Lima Charlie also, I replied. Continuing, I replied, I pass, passed in my lineup. Weatherby is two Alpha 10s with six Mark 82s, two Mavericks, and a full load of 30 Mike Mike apiece. We're 15 minutes south of Alpha 1-0 at base plus 12. Blacklist copies all. Ready to copy target information. Weatherby's ready to copy, I replied, reaching for the grease pencil clipped to my kneeboard and wrapping the elastic band attached to it around my gloved right hand so I wouldn't drop it while attending to other ta cockpit tasks. As the task passed the target details, I scribbled the data onto the glass of the right side of my canopy. Although I could not read it now, I knew the sun would be up soon revealing the information. Your target is an artillery battery at 2853 North, 04818, the dash said. After a long pause indicated the voice that I now knew as Blacklist was finished with his transmission, I spoke up. Weatherby copies target. Say threats, weather, and nearest friendlies. Weather unknown. Friendlies nil. Threats, small arms, triple A. Possible SA-2s and 7s was the answer. Blacklist, say position and type of triple A, I asked. Type and position unknown. Great. They don't have a clue on the threats, I lamented to myself. The morning sun was just breaking over the horizon, and we were about 10 minutes from the Saudi Arabian-Kuwaiti border as I plotted the target area on my first, my first target area on my 1 to 500,000 scale map to give me a general idea of where it was in relation to the known threat locations I had plotted on that map after the morning's intelligence briefing, as well as its proximity to the relative safety of the border. I was about 20 mi it was about 20 miles into Kuwait, right on the coast near a large pier. Next, I plotted the target onto my 1 to 250,000 scale map to pinpoint it more closely in relation to the immediate area around it. The detail of this map revealed that the pier was part of an industrial complex featuring a large power substation. There were several warehouses along the beach with a paved road running along the coast inland from there. The coordinates for the artillery site plotted out just across the road from the warehouses. It struck me that the target was awfully deep into enemy territory for only the second day of the war. We were the first aircraft to work in that area, as the first day was taken up with dismantling the Iraqi air defense systems, with most strikes occurring against the early warning radar sites located along the border. The first night's missions were also generally fairly close to the border for A-10s, with most of the other air activity confined to the Baghdad activity, Baghdad area. The prospect of being among the first to go deep did not appeal to me. Neither did the prospect of attacking a target so close to the coast. Since the start of military action to expel the Iraqi forces from Kuwait, the prevailing thought in the press was that if the coalition ground attack was launched, the first wave would be an amphibious assault on the beaches from Kuwait City, south to the border city of Ras al Kafji. Apparently, the Iraqis had been paying attention to the press because they had heavily fortified in their coastline positions. We were told to expect heavy AAA as we crossed feet dry from over the Persian Gulf. Additionally, we expected heavy AAA and surface-to-air missile activity in the vicinity of the larger cities and the Kuwaiti airfields and army barracks. With a large army complex only five miles northwest, two coastal refinery cities, Al-Amadi and Al-Fuhakil, only five miles north, and the huge Ahmed Al-Jabbar Air Base, 20 miles to the west, I didn't like any avenue of approach. I decided that feet wet was the lesser of the evils, reasoning that due to our enormous naval presence, the Gulf was relatively safe, and in this way we could distance ourselves from the SAMs, keep the rising sun at our backs, and hopefully preserve some element of surprise. As we headed toward the border, my heart was again racing at the prospect of battling the heavy coastal defenses. The sounds from my radar warning receiver only heightened my anxiety as they told of SA-2 SAM radars searching the sky ahead. Coincidentally, the CRC chose this time to begin their periodic VHF broadcast of threats. As they began to list the missile sites with reference to a common point on the ground, or bullseye as we called it, my pulse quickened still more. Sparky's voice over FM revealed that he was feeling the pressure too, as he informed me that his RWR was also receiving SA-2 signals. Weatherby's got, Weatherby 2's got a 2 at 12, he said. One same was my terse reply. As the CRC's broadcast continued, we flew north along the Saudi coast toward the border. Listening for any threats near our target area and wrestling with my growing fear, I was curiously struck with how beautiful the morning was. The sun was rising gloriously, casting a million sparks off the calm blue waters that lapped the desert below. Except for a high, thin, cirrus cloud layer, a gorgeous day was shaping up, 
It was a scene not unlike that I'd seen many times before, perhaps while flying along the southeast coast of the U.S., along the Sea of Japan over Korea's east coast, or more recently above England's North Sea coast. I'd seen similar scenes many times. A familiar sight, yes, but how out of place it now seemed when considered with the context of our purpose on this particular morning. Again, my mind wandered, and again I reminded myself that I could not afford to give in to these distractions. Once again, Sparky's voice brought me back to reality. One, two, do you plot the target about 20 miles deep? Yeah, sorry, I meant to compare with you, I said, angry that I allowed myself to be distracted and forgotten to confirm the target with my windman. I plot it as... I plot it out as about a mile southwest of a large pier, just inland from the coast, in Alpha Hotel 4. Two same, he, obvious, he said, obviously not pleased with the location either. We were now only a couple minutes flying time from the border, and I was beginning to realize that we were not yet ready to face a heavily defended target. We were both too keyed up, and I hadn't formulated a sufficient plan of attack yet either. Fortunately, friendly ground troops were not engaged, so time was not a factor in our attack. A few extra minutes would not make a difference, so I decided to take a couple of penalty laps. Penalty laps were my name for having to circle over a point to prepare a plan of attack or get into position to release ordnance. Rather than continuing to the target and the threats as I had plotted and planned, I decided to circle at our present position, still well south of the Kuwaiti border. There was now sufficient sunlight that we could assume a tactical formation, that is, one in which we increased the spacing between our aircraft to a mile or so to enhance our visual lookout for air and surface threats and increase our ability to maneuver more aggressively and more freely. For penalty laps in friendly airspace, I generally used a trail formation, sending my wingman a mile behind me. I thumbed the microphone switch upward and said, weather be two, go trail. One's coming left for a couple penalty laps. Toop. Elaborating on my reason for circling, I added, we both need to calm down and get ready to drop. Turn off all your lights and stand by chaff flare check. Two copies. As it was daylight now, we didn't need our external formation lights or anti-collision strobes anymore to see each other or to be seen by other coalition aircraft. Although peacetime regulations directed leaving the lights on at all times to help in deconfliction, they could only highlight our position to the enemy and our wartime practice was to extinguish them before crossing the border. Also before crossing, we accomplished a check of our self-protection chaff and flare dispensers. My pre-flight plan was to accomplish this check shortly after takeoff. But with the frenzied events of the mission to this point, coupled with my wandering mind, I had neglected to do so. After turning off all my external lights and giving Sparky sufficient time to change the four switches necessary to extinguish his, I said over FM, Weatherby, chaff flare check. Two's ready was the reply. With the index finger of my left gloved hand, I depressed the small red button on the front of the right throttle grip. They prepared three times in rapid succession. This caused three flare cartridges to be ejected. As they hit the airstream under the wing and quickly trailed behind to join the exhaust of the twin turbo pans which propelled me forward at nearly 350 miles an hour, they burned white hot, ready to decoy heat-seeking missiles away from the engines. Because the flares fall directly behind the aircraft's flight path at the time of release, they are difficult to see from the cockpit without turning. In order to confirm the proper operation of this critical system, we checked each other's aircraft to ensure three good flares came out. Good flares, Sparky confirmed over the FM radio, sounding a little more relaxed than in previous transmissions. As he said this, three flares streamed out from under his wing, glowing bright orange and then fading into long fingers of white smoke as they extinguished and fell away behind his jet. You're good also, I transmitted. Satisfied that our flare systems were operating normally, I looked towards my left wingtip as my left pinky finger just, just pressed the small red button on the front of the left throttle. Immediately, hundreds of tiny metal strips were ejected from under the wingtip and billowed into a small cloud in the turbulent air. Next, I repeated this procedure looking at the opposite wing to ensure chaff was also coming from under the right wingtip. It was, so I was satisfied that should I need to decoy radar signals away from my aircraft, I could generate a good-sized cloud of this highly reflective material behind my jet. The penalty laps were definitely helping me get my act together. And while completing the pre-target pre checks, my mind was constantly working to formulate a plan of attack. When the checks were complete, I relayed the plan to Sparky. Weatherby, we'll coast out feet wet and head north towards the target. We'll drop the bombs first. Rip six. Two copies. Okay, let's do it, I added cheerfully, trying to further reduce the tension. It sounded like a simple task. Fly north and ripple all six bombs in one pass. I hoped the reality would be as simple, guessing that it seldom would not be.
Finally, feeling ready to attack the target, I turned northeast towards the Persian Gulf. Weather be wedge, I said to terminate holding and send Sparky back to our travel formation. Two, he replied, also sounding ready. We coasted out feet wet, overhead the Saudi border town of Ras al Kafti, and turned north towards the target. As I rolled out of the turn, I pull, pushed the throttles forward to the stop and then cracked them back slightly to ensure Sparky would be able to keep up. Weatherby, pods on, fence in bombs, I said, directing Sparky to switch his electronic countermeasures pod to our pre-brief setting and set up his weapons release switches to drop bombs. We were about four minutes from the target as I switched hands on the control stick, reached down to my right side, and flipped the switch that started my ECM pod. I then twisted the weapons release mode selector to the RIP single, RIP SGL setting. Check that the number six was showing in the quantity selector and ensured the proper release interval was set. I then pushed in the weapons station four and eight selector switches and flipped the master arm switch to the arm position. Finally, I rotated the aim nine switch from the select position back to cool, which allowed the green ready lights to illuminate in the two weapon stations. Now the red weapons release or pickle button on the top of the control stick was hot. One push would release all six of my 500 pound bombs. As we flew north, we remained about five miles from the beach, which kept us out of range of most of the coastal offenses. Approaching the target area, we were still being looked at by various enemy radars, noticeably those associated with the SA-2 surface to air missile. But we hadn't observed any launches, nor had I seen any AAA. Of course, I wasn't totally certain what SAM launches or AAA would look like. A few days before the start of the war, as the probability of armed conflict was becoming greater, a couple of pilots from the 706th gave an informal briefing on what AAA looked like. Lieutenant Colonel Seth Groth Wilson and Major Larry Hulk McCaskill had been lieutenants, forward air controllers, during the latter days of the war in Southeast Asia and had seen plenty of AAA. They vividly described the visual characteristics of 23, 37, and 57 millimeter projectiles. It was truly amazing to see the same bunch of guys who had daydreamed during hundreds of dry, lifeless intelligence briefings generally served up. Uh, okay, sorry. It was truly amazing to see the same bunch of guys who had daydreamed during hundreds of dry, lifeless briefings intelligence personnel generally served up be so utterly spellbound by growth in Hulk's presentation. Certainly in part, the high-level attention was due to the rare opportunity to hear the actual combat experiences of seasoned veterans. More probably, though, it was the re realization that soon this information might very well save our lives, and that's what held our attention. We were reminded that 23-millimeter guns came in single, double, and quad-barreled varieties, and that the shells exploded at about 8,000 feet. They shot at about 100 rounds per second per barrel. What were the most... What were uh, what we were most interested in, though, was what we would actually see so we could avoid the deadly airbursts. In this regard, we were told that 23 millimeter looked like popcorn as the rapidly sh fired shells burst into small white clouds. As for 37 millimeter, the effective range was about the same, but the number of barrels only one or two, depending on the make of the gun. The airburst was larger and more silver than that of the 23 millimeter. The real threat, though, given our planned weapons release parameters, would be the 57 millimeter guns. The big boys. These could reach out and touch us at 15,000 feet. They had a very large shell which burst into an ominous dirty white cloud with a dark center. It was these visual cues that I intently scanned the skies for as a large pier near our target came into my view. Pushing the sticks slightly forward, I began a gentle descent to our planned base altitude of 15,000 feet. That altitude was computed to allow a dive to 45 degrees nose low in about five seconds for the pipper to track to the target before reaching the planned release altitude of 10,000 feet. Due to the fact that the A-10 did not have a computer bombing system, correct dive angle and altitude above the target were critical to accurate bombing. Equally important was the estimated headwind or tailwind, which would affect the bomb's flight path after release, the correct airspeed, no G on the aircraft, a lot to think about. The INS corrected for crosswinds, but head or tailwind had to be factored into the Pipper's depression settings. Since the wind was out of the west at about 20 knots, and I had planned to attack on an axis of east to west, I added a few mils to the basic setting to compensate for the headwind and dialed the pipper down until that setting was displayed in the HUD. Approaching the pier, I reached for my 1 to 250,000 scale map again and compared what I saw on the ground with what the plotted position of the target was. I found the road running along the coast, 
and the warehouses, but apparently we're still too far away to see the artillery site. Our squad squadron ground liaison officer had showed us many target photos, and artillery sites were typically half moon shaped with five or six gun pits connected by a troop trench. Often other trenches ran from each pit to a central point from which a fire control was carried out. Someone had once observed that this configuration looked much the same as the impression a dog's foot makes in the sand. For these for this reason, we often referred to the standard artillery site as a puppy paw. It was a puppy paw that I expected to see as it continued north. As the pier passed off my left wing, I began to gentle turn to the left, which would not only head us back towards the area where the target should be, but would also result in a flight path closer to the beach. Although I wasn't keen on getting any closer to the coastal defenses, I had to find the target, and I didn't want to spend any more time searching than necessary. Every moment meant more time for the enemy to find us visually, and most certainly, from all the activity in our radar warning receiver, they were aware of our general position. As I rolled out of the turn, I looked over my left shoulder to make certain Sparky had been able to keep up with the 180-degree turn and our high power setting. He was, as usual, in position and, no doubt, scanning through our formation for surface-to-air threats. It was our contract with each other that while I concentrated on the target itself, he would be responsible for searching the surrounding area for threats. As I looked back towards the target area, my peripheral vision caught a white smoke trail coming up from the pier at my right 5 o'clock. Sam launch, I immediately thought. Sparky saw the missile about the same time, and in a very excited and broken voice, he called out, Weatherby, break right, Sam. Years of simulating Sam's coming at me and practicing my reaction took over, and even before Sparky finished his short radio transmission, I instinctively began a hard right turn into the missile to both keep it in sight and to turn my hot engine exhaust away in case it had a heat-seeking warhead. Additionally, my thumb depressed the microphone button down, and my dry throat managed to squeak out that I was contact the missile streaking towards me. Furiously, my left pinky finger punched the chaff button as my left index finger repeatedly jabbed the flare button. Time seemed to stand still during those few frenzied seconds, and the event seemed crystal clear in my mind. My jet was standing on the right wingtip with the nose cutting across the horizon, and all my attention was focused on the supersonic missile at the tip of the white smoke trail. Vividly, I could see the white hot exhaust corkscrewing from behind the wobbly red glow at the base of the missile. With about 60 degrees of turn completed, I suddenly regained perspective of time and abruptly rolled out of the turn. The missile was rapidly tracking backward across my canopy, and ironically, ironically it was over as abruptly as it began. Almost stunned that I hadn't either been near, hit or narrowly missed, I now almost stunned that I hadn't been hit, but just narrowly missed. I now almost casually watched as the red glow faded and the white smoke trail died out and the missile fell helplessly toward the blue waters below. As I noticed my heart pounding and my lungs fighting to pull in enough air, I scanned the pier for signs of other firings as I fully, fully realized what they had what had taken place. A small Sam, probably one of the handheld shoulder fired SA-7 heat seeking varieties had been launched towards me from the vicinity of the pier. As I saw it, fear and panic gripped me for an instant and the resulting temporal distortion blurred my perce perception of time. Fortunately, training paid off and the near instinctive result in actions were correct. Apparently the missile was fired just, uh, just about out of range as its supply of propellant was exhausted shortly before it flew behind me. Although
back. I think we're back. I'm not sure where somebody in the chat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the chat comments really quick here and see where we're at. Hey, thanks, boss. I see um, Michael Connor said uh, great book. I'm going to put that one up because I like that. I like that comment. Right on. Thanks, boss. Glad you're enjoying it. And um, let's see. Rebel. Man, I like Rebel. Rebel Rebel's always so positive in the comments. I like that. Thanks, bud. I'm um, I'm excited to get it out. It's been a long time coming. Hey, somebody in the chat, tell me where I went off the air. <laughs> 925. Okay, somebody at 914 said so. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Cool. Zena, thanks for the comments there, bud. Appreciate that, too. Um, well, I, I was really in the exciting part of this, too. Um, not sure where we went off the air. I lost the Internet for some reason for a moment, but we're back. Anyway, um, so let me say something about where we were. Hopefully, I think we went, I went through the, the missile engagement, so we'll um, talk about that here in a second. I'm going to, I'm just going to, we're an hour and 17. I'm just going to paraphrase um, the rest of this mission. Because it was, it was uneventful fairly after that. So first mission, first weapons pass. Now I'll say this. I wrote that account actually in the desert uh, after hostilities ended. Um, what we call the Operation Desert Calm, I think that's what we call that. Uh, we were doing a border, border, you know, sort of border. Um, uh, what we call those, boss? We call them sort of like um, just you know recognition of the border. We were flying along the border, making sure that the Iraqis knew that that you know that we're we're patrolling Saudi Arabia, we're patrolling Kuwait. You're not allowed here anymore. <laughs> you left. We don't come back. Um, also, another cool thing is, um, I'll talk about that later, but, but so, um, uh, so I started writing this book in the desert during Operation Desert Calm. So we were one of the last squadrons. We were the last squadron in, so we were the last squadron out. We left until like June um, of uh, this year, so that year. So, um, so during that time, obviously, um, a lot of the procedures, tactics, weapons were still very classified. And so there's some details about this first engagement with a missile that I didn't include in the book uh, when I first wrote it, that now 33 years later, I can. So um, it ha actually happened a little bit differently than, than I depicted just now in my narrative, but, but, but it was no less as, um, as uh, emotion filled. The emotions were the same. The details were slightly different. And I'll talk about that. And I will, and I have revised that in the, um, in another, uh, in some notes for my uh, second draft of the book. But anyway, um, so first weapons pass, I get a missile shot at me and it almost hits me and that gets your attention. Um, and so I remember just being flooded with these emotions. Um, I was a little embarrassed that I was so afraid um, that, um, and, and I, but, but, but yet terrified because I almost got a missile I got a missile shot at me as my first weapons pass. Things had not gone well on that mission, obviously, up to that point. A lot of chaos, a lot of confusion, not all my fault. Um, but it's just the fog of war. The, um, the fact of of doing things in, differently, the, the fact that you don't know how the radios are going to be until you get all those airplanes up there with all those electrons going through the sky. Um, the weather... Was actually a little worse than I depicted depicted in the book in that first um, um, the first draft there as well, but um, um, uh, but but the the true emotions of of things being so surreal were 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 all very very factual. Um, the temporal distortion uh, during that first uh, that missile engagement was um, significant. Um, there's another <coughs> excuse me. 
Another funny story that I'll recount in the final edition of the book, where during that temporally distorted state, I actually um, uh, sort of flashed back to one of my, I think it was my very first uh, threat intelligence briefing in my first squadron, which was on the SA-7 and SA-14 shoulder-fired heat-seeking missiles. So um, it's, it is amazing how the training uh, takes over. We do fight like we train. We always said we train the way we're going to fight because you do end up fighting the way you train. But there were just a lot of differences in this conflict than, than, than what we anticipated, than what we'd done before, certainly than what we trained for in, in Europe. My forward air control training, especially in Korea, came in very, very handy in things like target acquisition, map plotting. You know, those steps that I that I recount in the book of, of of you know getting the tasking, finding the target, plotting it on a map, plotting it onto a, a, a map with more detail, confirming it with a wingman, finding the target, him looking for the threats, all those things. It's a lot to go, lot to have happen. Um, I'll be interested to talk to Sparky because I never really gave a lot of consideration at that time to what must it have been like for a wingman. I'm really busy as a flight lead. All those things of keeping up with navigation and communications and and you know all the all the things that have to happen, finding the target, setting up the attack for the wingman he's got you know a lot going on in his cockpit as well, but he's going off my cues, my instructions um and um, my lead and so i'm I'm just assuming i'm I'm very anxious to talk to him about it. There must have been a lot more time for him to think about the enormity of what we were doing and um and maybe, you know, maybe uh, even have more trepidation than I had. Uh, as a flight lead, you're pretty busy. And so, at any rate, first weapons pass. <laughs> I don't even roll, I'm barely rolling in, and weapon missiles shot at me. So, defeat the missile. And then you climb. You clear out your shorts. <laughs> and, and, and you, you, but you still got a target to hit. And, well, there's no troops in contact. There's no ground troops uh, at that time. Um, and there wouldn't be for quite some quite a while. We didn't know that, of course, that, that day. But but um, so you have time to kind of stand off and assess the situation. Maybe now all that time you're becoming more and more of a target for the for the ground threats, of course. And it was about this time that that both Sparky and I started noticing um, as the light was coming up. We noticed the muzzle flashes that all along that coastal highway, along that beach, there were gun emplacements of anti-aircraft artillery, and you'd see the the muzzle flashes, and then realize that above you or below you, there's exploding projectiles. And they was those were between the target and I, as I went back out feet wet, um, Sparky and I, um, we did a couple of circles out there. And, and I thought, okay, um, I thought back to the briefing that, 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 um, that General Buster Glosson gave to all those pilots, the, uh, a couple morning, a couple nights before the war started, um, and I talk about this with Colonel O'Connor on the podcast, and I talk about it with Mover on the, particularly in my interview with Mover from a couple years ago. Um, that I remember him saying, "If the threat's not as brief, if the target's not as brief, if the weather is bad, bring it home. We'll find a better way and go back up because you don't want to get your ass handed to you, uh, uh, pressed in a bad situation. Because I need you on day two, and I need you on day." 20 and I need you, you know, for as long as this thing goes. I don't have any replacement pilots. We don't have uh, many replacement airplanes. I got you guys and I got your jets and we're going to get the thing done and uh, we're going to do it right and then we're going to go home. So do it smart. And so as I as I thought about the the low sun angle, the high white cirrus clouds, the muzzle flashes all along the beach, the missile that had just been shot at me, and now I'm standing off the coast again, and I see the target area. And by the way, it was in the parking lot of like a Home Depot type place. <laughs> no kidding. It's like you've got this beach, you've got this you know, this industrial area, then you've got hotels and condos up north, and you've got this coastal road. As I said, it's like driving up the coast of Florida or North Carolina. And, and then inland, you've got you know, this like strip shopping center, big shopping center. And it's like a Home Depot type place. And in the parking lot just happens to be the puppy's paw of artillery that is shelling into, uh, uh, towards Saudi Arabia. So it's just surreal. But as I'm looking at that target and I'm trying to lock up the Maverick missile on it, I'm thinking maybe it doesn't make sense in all this situation going on to try to drop bombs on that thing right now. 
maybe with a high sun angle. Now that I know where the target is, we get a better plan. We come back. Maybe we bring cluster bombs this time. You know, that kind of planning is going through my mind, which is partly driven by fear. I'm not going to lie, but partly driven by harkening back, harkening back to what General Glossen said about let's be smart. We need you to not get your ass handed to you going down the chute, pressing a bad situation. And so I felt like maybe this was the perfect storm of, of I thought it was not the perfect storm, but it was close enough. The perfect storm of, of like bad shit lining up to make me maybe get my ass handed to me. And so, but I thought maybe I can lock up with the Maverick missile and stand off, use the standoff capability of that weapon, but trying to get an electro optical missile to lock up, uh, you know, five miles away uh, onto a small artillery tube was proving difficult. And it was just not, I was just not getting a good contrast from light to dark on the, on the uh, IR, meaning heat source. Uh, it was too early in the morning. Uh, artillery doesn't give off a lot of heat source unless it's really firing away, unless there's a generator close by running or whatever. And, and in the dim, relatively still dim light, low, low sun angle, I just wasn't getting a good visual contrast breaking out in the uh, electro optical or you know, sort of televi television maverick of black and white um, gray and white and black so so that wasn't working either and so i made the decision and i remember saying to sparky sparky hey um we're heading we're heading south um uh i'm done is what i think think what i said and uh and he was ready to be done as, as well. And so, so we uh, boogie back. Uh, we were just off the coast. We boogie back down south. And um, I just remember as we get into uh, Saudi airspace, I remember this big, like emotional, like physical and emotional let just, just drain. Just wow. The enormity of what had just happened. Um, this instant sort of like worn out feeling. Um, now you got to fly back home. We had plenty of gas, but you're flying back to an airfield that's going to be very busy. Um, and in fact, you know, I started thinking, is it even going to be there? We launched for survival during a scud attack. Did the scud hit? Did it have chemical weapons? Did we lose our guys? Did we lose our airplanes? Is you know, is it even going to be a safe place to land? I started thinking about all that. Um, I didn't have a long time to think think about, wow, that was really scary. But I do remember this feeling coming over me that just gripped me for just a, you know, just a few seconds, really, that seemed like a long time. Once we'd safed up and we're back in, in Saudi space, we, we're relatively safe now. Before I started thinking about what am I going to find back at King Fog, I remember thinking, what the hell have I gotten us into? As I was talking with, um, with the Irish uh, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago that you know, uh, I've been heavily involved in the planning uh, part with him of getting those airplanes to the desert. We wanted to go. I mean, it was the Super Bowl. And if it was going to happen, we wanted to be on the starting team. And so we were so excited to be able to go so busy to and it was just so enormous the effort to get us there. And everybody did that so tremendously, so, so awesomely. Maintenance ops, everyone. And, and then there we are. And I'm doing what I wanted to do. And it's nothing like I thought it would be like. And I was scared. I was, uh, I felt unprepared in some regard. I felt like I was doing a lot of stuff right, but but not everything. And it was just different. And um, and and how do I make myself come do this again? I knew I would, but it's just this overwhelming sort of like I just remember being gripped with this thing. I just just this feeling I'd never had before of holy shit, what have I done? I mean, I wanted to be here, and we're here, and this sucks. This is awful. Uh, but then again, uh, you don't have long to think about that kind of stuff. You got work to do. So back to FOD we go, and it's a bright, sunny day now. Uh, there's the scuds, um, you know, landed well away from our air base. You know, they were pointing towards us, but they they fell off in the desert somewhere. So all was well. Everything's back to normal. My nose wheel steering still is not going to work probably. So I land and I actually get towed back. Uh, but then we did come up with another plan. Um, Sparky and I went back up around noon. Um, same target. Knew exactly where it was. We came in from different headings. And in about, like, I don't know, 30 seconds or something, you know, we put our 12 bombs across that thing and um, blew it off the face of the earth much better. <laughs> it got much better after that. There were still some some um, very difficult 
um, moments. So I recount the book and I'll tell stories about Shanghai story time another another day. But um, um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't all easier after that. But um, it's amazing what you can get used to. You get used to sleeping and having some breakfast and going and flying in combat and, um, you know, doing it again day after day until it's over. Um, and um, experience is um, is uh, the best teacher, <laughs> of course. And um, and it comes uh, the learning curve is steep. Um, it's a uh, it's an unforgiving school. But um, but you know what? By the way, that was the only problem ever that I had with an aircraft. Um, in terms of any sort of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of maintenance issue ever. Um, and it was just obviously a very minor issue, the little nose wheel steering thing that e easily fixed uh, for the next sortie. So um, I still flew that same airplane t twice more that day. Um, so um, anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed Shanghai story time. I enjoyed it. Um, uh, still got a lot of work to do on the book, as, as I see, but um, but I've looked at the comments and um, and uh, they seem to be um, they seem to be uh, very co very positive. Scott Atwood, I want to say, want to hear about the helicopter. Hey man, absolutely. Um, check out Mover. That my uh, interview with Mover. Um, I don't remember how far it is, and I'll send you I'll send you a message with that man. I'll break it out into um, um, to a. Um, to something shorter. Um, by the way, uh, last uh, comment here. This is a good one by my old boss. The first sortie was always the worst. They always got better. Yeah, no kidding. Um, my, at least my first sortie wasn't 12 hours like yours was. By the way, boss, just uh, just before we went on the about an hour before I went on the air tonight, I took um, I started breaking up your interview into shorter versions, and the first one that I posted is um, is you talking about you and Conley flying that first first mission um so um here's a good here's a really good comment from um from rebel rebel's always got good stuff to say we are always learning no kidding that is very true um uh, so another thing that i'm going to do um and I'll, I'll put up so many more comments here in a minute but the other the other thing um is um I want to kind of focus a little bit on mental health with my channel. Um, this is a big issue for veterans. You know, every 17 seconds in America, a veteran uh, takes their own life. Think about that for a minute. It's a sobering thought. Um, and so uh, mental health is a big issue. Um, you know, um, I just told a sober, sort of a harrowing or sobering war, war story. but. Um, but it did get better. We got better, um, and we systematically took apart that enemy. Um, I would say that my combat experience was very positive. Uh, the effect that it had on my career, my life afterwards, was very positive. Um, it's not something I'd want to go do again. <laughs> um, but if uh, you know, if I if there was, but man, I'll tell you during Afghanistan, during Iraq, second time, in Afghanistan, and now over. Um, you know, uh, in the, in the Middle East again, with A-10s over there, I chomp at the bit a little bit. And so they they called the day and said, "Hey, suit up, I'm going." I'm telling you, but um, it's just that kind of a thing. Maybe it's a little hard to explain uh, to to um, to someone that hasn't experienced it. But but um, but all that to say, I, I think my combat experience was 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 largely very positive. Um, I you know lucked into doing some neat things like shooting down a helicopter, winning the Distinguished Flying Cross. Um, that kind of propelled my career, such as it was for you know a few more years, and um, and, uh, and and maybe in some ways sort of defined my time in the A10. Um, it made it so that I can write a book and have something interesting to say, have a podcast that you know some people listen to and watch. So uh, so I'm thankful for that. Um, as we go into, but but I also talked about fear in um in 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 recounting these stories and and so i want to talk about mental health a little bit on this program um, first of all if you're having a mental health crisis if you're thinking about hurting yourself call 911 right now um, that's the best thing to do if you're a veteran you can call um, um it's 988 i think it's 988 988 is the veterans uh, uh hotline 
uh, for mental health, but really any issues that you have as a veteran. Um, but um, if you're thinking about hurting yourself, call 911. If you want to talk to somebody and you're a veteran, um, you want to look into VA benefits, you want to look into mental health treatment or counseling, um, get, a, get a hold of the VA at 988. Um, go to your local VA regional center. There's a lot of really talented folks there that want to help you. Um, as I've um, as I've said on, on a couple of other interviews I've done, I think with Mover, um, I've availed myself of some of this help as well. So I know this firsthand. But let's talk about fear for a minute. Um, you know, fear can really be a debilitating thing. Um, I was afraid on that first mission a lot. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have time to be super afraid um, for most of it because I'm super busy, right? And so that's another thing is that if you're super afraid, do something. Do something positive. Um, you know, the, the the being gripped by fear and paralyzed by fear is really the, the worst part of fear. The working through fear by taking a minute, taking a couple of deep breaths, thinking about it, maybe say a short prayer, get a plan, and move forward, like my penalty laps, right? I wasn't as much afraid as I was just behind the jet and not ready for what I needed to do. Now, um, that's not a good thing, obviously. And and later on, when troops were in contact, you didn't have time for that kind of a kind of a penalty lap, take take a minute. But but it made sense at that time. Um, the working through my fear after that missile shot. Well, I got busy doing something else, finding another way to try to attack the target. But um, but then I had to work through the fear of how do I make myself go do this again? Because it was awful. And it was not like I thought it would be. Um, and I did some stuff wrong. Um, and again, um, that's part of just, um, uh, you know, sort of a fortitude. You talk to people. I remember, you know, and Sparky had to be, he was afraid too. We got into, we actually went into a kind of a bubble hangar. Colonel O'Connor, remember this, this big white bubble, like, I don't know, held up by air or something, kind of a bubble hanger that maintenance used. And, and we had some time where they, uh, we weren't going to do a uh, integrated combat turn hot pit in our jets because mine had a nose wheel steering problem that had to be addressed. And, and uh, because we'd launched this alert jet, we, we weren't in the tasking cycle. So, uh, I just remember calling back up to ops and talking to somebody. You might have talked to Colonel O'Connor. Said, "Hey, you know that target's still there. I know where it is now. The sun's higher. You know, okay, let's do." If somehow we worked out that we're going back to that target. So, so we knew that. So, um, and it was interesting. I remember I talked to Sparky about this, but I remember the the maintenance guys had this like boombox. The kids at home probably don't even remember that what that is, but it's like a you know like a um, entertainment system that has some speakers attached to it and it had a cassette player in it <laughs> cassettes just a little thing about like this it had music on them so it had a cassette player in it and sparky's like rummaging through their like pile of cassettes and he comes across funny he says hey shang uh this guy's from like where you're where you're from in oklahoma garth brooks i'd never heard of him yet <laughs> so that was the like, largest entertainer of all time garth brooks and um his wife, Sandy, at the time, says, so Sandy had this, uh, she likes this guy, uh, I'm going to put this cassette in. And I remember this song, the first song came out was Unanswered Prayers. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers uh, is the uh, is sort of the premise of the song. Um, and um, and I, I kind of thought about that too. And, 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 and um, uh, but it, so Sparky and I just kind of chilled out with some music and we talked about, you know, what, um, what had transpired and what we're going to do differently next time. And then I remember um, that night, um, it was pretty late that night because we flew three missions that day. It's a total of like 15 hours by the time we started till we were finished. <coughs> we were dead tired. We got something to eat at the chow hall. And then he was, as I, as I alluded to, he was like three rooms down from me in the tent. We had three on each side, so I was at one end of the tent, he's at the other in you know, our little rooms. And, and I remember him coming down, knocking on my door. He says, hey, Shane, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, man, come in. He came in and sat down. And he said, hey, man, um, yeah, like we're spending way too much time in the target area. <laughs> and because of his experience in F4s, it's a backseater in Europe, they were like one pass haul ass, you know, toss a nuke or whatever and haul ass back home. And in the A-10, we were uh, going up and, you know, 
finding the target and, and figuring out how to attack it and you know maybe attacking several different targets and then we got into kill box operations where we'd have a like 15 by 15 mile square and you just look for artillery and armor in there and use your ordnance and your gas wisely to to attrit the enemy's combat capability in in kuwait um so a very different mission than what he had you know, flown in the backseat of F-4s and what we had trained to in England. So, um, you know, that was a manifestation of, of some fear and trepidation on his part, too. And so, you know, get having somebody you can talk through those things with, um, I think, you know, taking a deep breath, saying a prayer, making a plan, moving forward um, is, is, I think, a, you know, maybe some pretty good tactics to deal with um, with fear. Fear can be a paralyzer. Fear can be a motivator. Um, fear isn't altogether a bad thing. Um, in fact, I, I, you know, I don't know. My position is if you were flying jets in Desert Storm or any conflict and you're not a little bit afraid, I'm worried about you, frankly. Um, and um, I knew some guys like this um, that that said they weren't afraid and maybe they weren't but they should have been <laughs> a little healthy fear i think is a good thing and in fact um this is just anecdotal not scientific but i think the guys that were kind of the most um and not really particularly in our squadron but i know i knew a lot of the guys that were that were in the desert because i'd been in a couple other squadrons prior to that and um the guys that were like the the you know the balls to the wall you know, shit hot fighter pilot guys um, uh, maybe weren't necessarily the most effective in combat all the time, frankly. I mean, the guys that were kind of a lot of ego and not afraid, um, I, I observed weren't always the most effective guys either. So I think a, a healthy fear for things um, can be a good motivator. It can help you plan better, study more. Um, there's a lot of times I was, I was afraid of failing in pilot training. It's a whole other story. But um, but um, I think just, you know, having somebody to talk to, having a relationship, um, you know, with a higher power and turning the, the aspects of fear that can be healthy into something positive is maybe, a, you know, one way to look at it. So I don't know. Um, let's see what else is going on in the uh, in the old chat room here. Uh, Zena said I might have been down for like three to five minutes. So, well, that's I did not I did not plan that, but that's a good motivator to um, to um, get the book. So, um, bu -bu 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 -bu. here we go. Somebody, this is good. This is a good comment here. I'm gonna put this one up. Yeah, we got some. I got some really good, good, um, good uh, listeners here. Uh, one YouTuber mentioned, "Don't let a temporary situation turn into a permanent bad solution." Something of that nature, yeah, right on, absolutely, and and don't let a don't let a temporary search situation um, in your life, whatever it is, depression, fear, anxiety, loss, turn into a you know a, a permanent loss of your life. Um, um, I'll talk I'll talk more about that another time, but um, but we got Thanksgiving coming up. There's a lot to be thankful for as well. I hope um, hope everybody's got plans to spend Thanksgiving with family or friends. Um, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing for Thanksgiving because it's Shanghai story time. So <laughs> I knew, um, let's see, you get rid of that comment. There we go. Um, I'm going to be spending Thanksgiving uh, this year at the Phoenix house, which is in Oklahoma city. Okay. See Oklahoma city's um, transitional living facility for homeless male veterans. Um, uh, up until about a year ago, I spent the previous three plus years as uh, a um, resident manager there. Um, planned to just be there to help them lock the thing down during COVID. I was on their board of directors, and um, it's a nonprofit here in Oklahoma City that is, has a grant from the VA. We're about a block from the VA Medical Center, um, uh, so very close by. So the, the guys get um, case management, counseling, health care, mental health care, substance abuse treatment if they need it, uh, all those kinds of services through the VA. Uh, they all have case managers uh, from the VA. Um, and so the idea is to take um, male veterans who are homeless and put them into a transitional living group home. We have 22 beds there um, and trans help the guys transition from homelessness to uh, gainful employment 
and independent living. So there's job training, job placement, housing uh, services uh, as well. All the things that guys need. We provide all the food, um, everything that they need. The, the beans and the bullets and the beds. No bullets. The beans and the beds. <laughs> it's, it's, my, it's my forward application. Beans and beds and books and and uh, benefits and everything to help these guys get back, uh, you know, back um, on their feet. All the guys are veterans, from young guys to old guys, combat veterans and not. Um, but it's neat to see guys. Um, uh, sort of regain their vitality, their independence, uh, their confidence, their esprit de corps, to realize that they were all veterans. They all served, served well, served honorably, um, and, and, and can get their lives back uh, on track again. Um, and so it's a neat program. Uh, like any nonprofit, however, um, especially in this time of great inflation in our country, it runs on a shoestring. Every two years, there's a there's a contract with the VA for the services. They set a, a daily rate, so it's like a per diem. It's called grant per diem, um, and so um, it's one of those things that uh, it's a labor of love. In fact, I was working there just a couple nights ago, from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., kind of just to to um, to be the you know, adult supervision there, uh, filling in for someone who was ill. Um, so it's a shoestring staff. It's a shoestring budget. Um, nobody's making much money there for sure. I'm a volunteer now and, um, and happy to do it. It's a, it's a very, very worthy cause. Um, so, you know, with things like Thanksgiving, I know our, our director, uh, last night went out and, um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure she slapped her own credit card down to buy all the groceries uh, for tomorrow. we got our, the guy that does our, our pest control is bringing two massive turkeys tomorrow. I think he said they're like 28 pounders. He roasted those. He's donating those. So I'm going to meet him there at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. With these, he's he's going to deliver two massive turkeys for, for us. And, and so, um, um, so what I'm going to throw out here is um, I have um, Venmo and Cash App. And on uh, Cash App, it is um, at two bags full, just like it's spelled right right there at two bags full and on Venmo that's cash up. It's just two bags full at Venmo. It's the whole thing. Two bags full Shanghai. If you would like to make a donation, um, I'm going to say a donation of $20 or more to cash up or Venmo um, at those addresses. I will donate to the Phoenix house for um, to offset uh, things like Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, um, and what I will do is I will send to you an autographed copy of two bags full when it comes out in early spring. So um, $20 or more donation. And then also, I'm going to be setting up a, um, a, a place on YouTube. I'm almost, I'm almost to the number of subscribers and, and uh, views that I can do this, that I can set up a, um, a uh, I can set up Super Chat, uh, which would be a fundraiser for, for the organization as well. And then I can also um, set up like a, like super fans where, where you get access to more content. And so um, if you make a $20 or more donation to at two bags full on cash app or at two bags full Shanghai on Venmo, um, I will and, and send me your email address on there. I'll get in touch with you, but um, I will include you for a year and my super fans thing. So you'll get all the extra content for free and I will send you a um, autographed and even inscribed as you would like. A uh, copy of the hard copy of Two Bags Full when it comes out. So um, hopefully that'll be a motivator uh, to raise a little bit money for um, for the Phoenix House, Phoenix Recovery Institute, or Phoenix House as we call it. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, so uh, as well. And, um, and 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 nonprofit means nonprofit, by the way, for sure. Uh, it's a labor of love, great organization, good bunch of guys. We've got uh, we'll have 20, uh, I think 20 guys there tomorrow for uh, Thanksgiving dinner. It's going to be a great time watching football, eating big turkeys and all the fixings. So I'm excited to uh, to join the guys tomorrow for that. Hope you're excited about what you're doing for Thanksgiving. Hope you're going to be with family and friends. Give thanks for all the great things in life because there are a lot. And give thanks for freedom. I've got my flag behind me tonight. Um, freedom ain't free, kids. Remember that. And uh, thanks for watching. Smash the like button. Hit the subscribe button. That helps us out as well on the channel. Tell your friends. Um, and uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday at 810 for Warthog Wednesdays. Thanks again for being with me. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a good night.